All right. So yesterday we read chapters one and two. And we learned about little Sal. She's going on a road trip with her grandparents. We are on chapter three. Bravery. And remember, we don't know where her mom is. Is her mom dead? Is her mom alive? We don't know. Because I first saw Phoebe on the day my father and I moved to Euclid, I began my story of Phoebe with the visit to the red-headed Margaret Cadavers, where I also met Mrs. Partridge, her elderly mother. Margaret nearly fell over herself being nice to me. What lovely hair she had. She, what lovely hair, she said. And aren't you sweet? I was not sweet that day. I was particularly ornery. I wouldn't sit down and I wouldn't look at Margaret. As we were leaving, Margaret whispered to my father, John, have you told her yet how we met? My father looked uncomfortable. No, he said, I tried, but she doesn't want to listen. Now that was the truth, absolutely. Who cares, I thought, who cares how he met Margaret Cadaver? When at last we left Mrs. Cadavers and Mrs. Partridge, we drove for approximately three minutes. Two blocks from Margaret Cadavers was the place where my father and I were going, were now going to live. Tiny squirt trees, little birdhouses in a row, and one of those birdhouses were ours. No swimming hole, no barn, no cows, no chickens, no pigs. Instead, a little white house with a miniature patch of green grass in the front of it. It wasn't even enough grass to keep a cow alive for five minutes. Let's take a tour, my father said, rather too heartedly. We walked through the tiny living room into the miniature kitchen and upstairs into my father's pint-sized bedroom and onto my pocket-sized bedroom and into the wee bathroom. I looked out the upstairs window down into the backyard. Half of the tiny yard was a concrete patio and the other half was another patch of grass that, well, that our imaginary cow would devour in two bites. There was a tall wooden fence all around the yard and it was left and to the left and right of our yard were identical fenced plots. After, moving van, after the moving van arrived and two men crammed our by banks furniture into our birdhouse, my father and I inched into the living room crawling over sofas and chairs and tables and boxes and boxes and boxes. Hmm, my father said, it looks like, it looks as if we tried to squeeze all the animals into the chicken coop. Three days later, I started school and saw Phoebe again. Oh wait, time out. So he's saying like, they're trying, he's like considering like their furniture, squeezing all their furniture into a chicken coop. Chicken coops aren't normally that big. So like there's all these boxes, everything they brought from their big old Vibangs home. And now it's in this tiny little Euclid home. So he's like, oh, it seems like we brought too much stuff. Three days later, I started school and saw Phoebe again. She was in my class. Most of the kids in my new school spoke in quick, sharp bursts and dressed in stiff new clothes and wore braces on their teeth. Most girls wore their hair in the exact same way, a shoulder length bob. That's what they call it. With long bangs that they were repeatedly shook out of their eyes. We once had a horse who did that. Everyone kept touching my hair. Don't you ever cut it, they said. Can you sit on it? How do you wash it? Is it naturally black like that? Do you use conditioner? I couldn't tell if they liked my hair or if I thought I looked like a wang doodle. So remember, they have a Native American like heritage in their family. So Sal, if you can imagine her, has like normally Native Americans have really dark hair. So she has like jet black, long, long, long hair. And according to the girls in Euclid, Ohio, that's not really the style. They have like shoulders like bobs. So like, you know, little hair. Kind of like uh, the length of Corgan's hair, but they have bangs and stuff. But Corgan, your hair is not quite a bob. But that's besides the point. What about your length? <sighs> One girl, Mary Lou Finney, was the most peculiar thing. Like out of the blue, she would say, omnipotent or beef brain. I couldn't make any sense of it. There were Megan and Christy who jumped up and down like parch peas, Moody Beth Ann, and pink cheeked Alec Alex. There was Ben who drew cartoons all day long and a particular English teacher named Mr. Barkway. Berkway. And then there was Phoebe Winterbottom. Ben called her Free Bee Ice Bottom and drew a picture of a bumblebee with an ice cube on its bottom. Phoebe tore it up. Phoebe was a quiet girl who stayed mostly by herself. She had a pleasant round face and huge, enormous sky blue eyes. Around this pleasant round face, her hair, as yellow as crow's foot, curled in short ringlets. 
during the first week when my father and I were at Margaret's, we ate dinner there three times that week. I saw Phoebe's face twice more at her window. Once I waved at her, but she didn't seem to notice. And at school, she never mentioned that she had seen me. One day at lunch, she slid into the seat next to me and said, Sal, you're so courageous. You're ever so brave. To tell the truth, I was surprised. You could have knocked me over with a chicken feather. Me? I'm not brave, I said. You are. You are brave. I was not. I, Salamonica Tree Hiddle, was afraid of lots of things. Lots and lots of things. For example, I was terrified of car accidents, death, cancer, brain tumors, nuclear war, pregnant women, loud noises, strict teachers, elevators, and scads of other things. But I was not afraid of spiders, snakes, and wasps. Phoebe and nearly everyone else in my new class did not have much fondness of these creatures. But on that day, when a dignified black spider was investigating my desk, I cupped my hands around it, carried it to the open window, and set it outside on the ledge. Mary Lou Finney said, Alpha and Omega, will you look at that? That fan was white as milk. All around the room, people were acting as if I had single-handedly taken out a fire-breathing dragon. So remember, Sal's like real in tune with nature. She loves trees. She has a big old farm back in, um, can, um, uh, love. they have a big old farm back where she's from. And, um, so she saw a spider and instead of like killing it, freaking out, like Mrs. Can I flow do like, I don't want to touch no spider. She cupped it in her hands, let it go. So Phoebe's telling her how brave she is for touching a spider. And Sal's like, uh, okay. What I have since realized is that if people expect you to be brave, sometimes pretend, you pretend that you are, even when you are frightened down to your very bones. But this was later during the whole thing with Phoebe's lunatic that I realized this. At this point in the story, Graham interrupted me and to say, why, Salamonica, of course you're brave. All Hiddles are brave. It's a family trait. Look at your daddy, your mama. Mama's not a real Hiddle, I said. She practically is, Graham said. You can't be married to a Hiddle that long and not become a Hiddle. So remember, when people get married, the female has a different last name. And normally, not all the time, but normally she takes the last name of the male. Like my maiden name was Max, and then I got married, and now my last name's Knifel. So um, grandma remember uh graham and gramps those are dad's parents they're you know saying well of course you're brave it's a hiddle trait and then you know she's like well my mom wasn't a hiddle but she's saying well she was married to him for so long she became one that is not what my mother used to say she would tell my father your hiddles are mysterious to me i'll never be a true hiddle she did not say this proudly she said as, as if she were sorry about it as if it was sort of failing in her my mother's parents, my other set of grandparents are Pickfords, and they are unlike my grandparents' Hiddle, as a donkey is unlike a pickle. Grandmother and grandfather Pickford stand straight up, as if sturdy steel poles ran down their backs. They wear starched iron clothing, and they are shocked or surprised, which is often they say, which is often they say, really, is that so? And their eyes, and their eyes open wide, and their mouths turn down at the corners. Once I asked my mother why grandmother and grandfather Pickford never laughed. My mother said, they're just so busy being respectable. Takes a lot of concentration to be that respectable. And then my mother laughed and laughed in a gentle way. And you could tell her she could tell her own spine was not made of steel because she bent in half laughing and laughing. So grandmother and grandfather Pickford are obviously like super proper people. Stand up straight. Their clothes are always ironed like you know, serious people. My mother said that grandmother Pickford's one act of defiance in her whole life as a Pickford was in naming her grandmother Pickford, whose own name is Gray Feather, named my mother Chan Hassan. It's an Indian name meaning tree sweet juice, or in other words, maple sugar. Only grandmother Fick Pickford ever called my mother by her Indian name though. Everyone else called my mother sugar. Most of the time, my mother seemed nothing like her parents at all, and it was hard for me to imagine that she had come from them. But occasionally, in small, unexpected moments, the corners of my mother's mouth would turn down and she'd say, really? Is that so? And sound exactly like a Pickford. So remember, Sal's name is Salamonica Tree Hiddle. So 
remember the tree sugar maple tree her mother's favorite and look her name actually means you know sugar maple <laughs> chan hassan so everyone i need you to look at the screen i'm going to share something with you really shortly in about one second okay so and let me share my screen so mrs kniefel decided that we're going to work really hard with this story and really dive in deep with it i feel like in um if you were with me for restart i feel like we literally just did a lot of reading we did not do a lot of questions or anything like that we literally did a lot of reading but I really want us to think deeply about this book because there's so many different hidden things within it. So you do have an assignment today. It's officially assigned now. We're going to go through it quickly. You have the rest of the day today to do it and tomorrow. It is due by 8 a.m. on Thursday. Okay. And we're going to go over it Thursday morning, which means everyone needs to have it done by Thursday morning. Um, I'm not going to be accepting late for these assignments since we're going to be going over it. So if you don't have it done Thursday morning, you're going to get a zero and a whole bunch of zeros will hurt you. So let me share the tab and we'll just go over it really quickly. So this is chapters one through three directions. You have eight questions. I want you to use complete sentences, pathological punctuation. You do not have to use restart or um, restart. You do not have to use radar, but you do have to restate your question. Okay. So story within a story, what story is being told within the story of the journey of the journey? Blah, blah, blah. What story is being told within the story of the journey that Sal is taking with her grandparents? Um, Phoebe's story. We already know that. What evidence shows that Sal is not pleased with Euclid, Ohio? That's where she lives now. Do you think Sal could have been happy in any new place? That's an opinion question. Who is Phoebe? Describe Graham and Gramps. Why does Sal feel a sense of urgency with the trip? That's in chapter two. Remember, she wants to get to um, Lewiston, Idaho by a certain time. Both Sal and her mother have unusual names. What do their names mean? How are their names similar? What do Sal's grandparents call her? There's two different names they call her. And then you have a little writing activity. It says Sal observes that when people expect you to be brave, you may pretend that you are even when you are feeling frightened. Have you ever felt this way? Describe an experience. So think about a time when people thought you were being brave, even though really inside you were scared. Uh, then you have five definitions that I want you to do. You can just look them up online. Um, heartedly, I couldn't find earlier, so I put a question mark. It's on page 11. But yeah, look those up. So you have the rest of the day today, and you have all reading RTI tomorrow. But it is due Thursday morning by 8 a.m. If it's not completed, you're getting zero because we're going to go over it Thursday before we continue reading. Okay, it's already assigned on your Google Classroom now. Does anyone have any questions? All the answers are in the first three pages, FYI, or the first three chapters, not three pages, sorry, the first three chapters, okay? You are free to go once uh, you would like to go start working. So long. We're not really getting a report 